Last week, author Salman Rushdie, who's had an Iranian fatwa against him for over 30 years, was brutally stabbed during a speaking event in New York. Last month, Masih Alinejad, a journalist and activist persecuted by the Iranian regime, was saved from, a, from an assassination plot in, outside of her house, also in New York. And threats from Iran against John Bolton and other U.S. officials have also recently been prevented. So what explains Iran's targeting of individuals for assassination even on U.S. soil? And how should the U.S. in particular and the West more generally act towards Iran? These are some of the questions that we'll be addressing in today's podcast. So welcome to New Idea Live, the podcast of the Ayn Rand Institute. I'm Agustina vergara Sid, a junior fellow at ARI, and with me are On Cargate, senior fellow at ARI, and Nikos Otirikopoulos, visiting fellow at ARI. Welcome, Onkar and Nikos. Hi, Agustina. Hi, everyone. Okay, so um, like I said, there's been like a lot of attacks uh, or attempted attacks recently in the in U.S. soil by Iranian sympathizers, sympathizers of the Iranian regime, or actually Iranian agents. So uh, one that made the headlines uh, and rightly so was the attack last week of Salman Rushdie. So Nikos, for our audience, the younger audience that may not know who Rushdie was and may not know what is this fatwa that he had against him, can you give us a little bit more context about that? Of course. So we need to go back to 1988. Salman Rushdie, a British Indian author, he was already an established and well-known author. So in late 1988, he released his fourth book, which was called The Satanic Verses. This was a book, a work of fiction, that dealt with the experience of some immigrants in the UK. And the narrative of the book is based mostly on dreams and visions that the protagonist had. In one of these dreams, uh, there is a story which is symbolic and relates to the Prophet Muhammad allegedly. He's not named, but there are some references. And these references and the way they're interpreted triggered many people in the Muslim world. So soon there were protests in Muslim countries. Soon there were bans about the book. The book was not, for example, published in India. And at some point in early 1989, Iran and its supreme leader, Khomeini, caught up. So, in Valentine's Day of 1989, Khomeini read the following, uh, released the following statement, which is what you described as fatwa. And I will read it, it's very short, but it will help our friends understand what we're talking about. Quote, I inform the proud Muslim people of the world that the author of the satanic verses, which is against Islam, the Prophet and the Quran, and all those involved in its publication who were aware of its content, are sentenced to death. I ask all Muslims to execute them where they find him. So this is not a condemnation. This is not. A, this is a direct suggestion, a direct order to the Muslims of the world to kill Rusty. Now, Rusty managed to escape attempts against his life. He went into hiding, but uh, the fatwa by Khomeini had a result, and the result was tragic that Japanese and the Turkish translators of the book were assassinated, and the, Norwe the Norwegian publisher was also assassinated. Because remember, Khomeini said anyone who was related with the book also needs to die. Now, the fatwa is still in operation. So although throughout the years and after Khomeini's death, quite often we hear that our relationship with Iran are in a different level because supposedly more moderate powers have taken over Iran. The fatwa is still under operation, A, because supposedly it cannot be revoked since Khomeini is not here anymore, but also because many Iranian officials have said no, the fatwa the death warrant against Rusty is still in operation. So we don't know who did, actually we know, probably we know who did, but we don't know what is his relations with Iran, the perpetrator of the recent attack on Rusty, but we do know that Iran in the most official way has condemned Rusty to death. 
So, Nikos, is it fair to say that a fatwa would be something uh, like it's just like uh, they put a bounty on someone's head, but it's not just that. It's also all Islamic people have kind of like a duty to go and try and assassinate the person that is subject of the, the subject of the fatwa. Is that correct? It is exactly correct. They have a moral duty and some of them have an actual duty because Khomeini is the supreme leader and it means also he's the leader of the army, of the revolutionary guards. Also Hezbollah, for example, in Lebanon considers him their leader. So there are many military forces in the world that consider this fatwa a direct order. And you talked about the bounty. There are many organizations in Iran and Iran hasn't got a civil society, so most of these organizations have the sanction of the state, who, which have actually put an actual bounty on Rusty's head. So the idea is whoever kills Rusty will receive X amount of, uh, of money. And it's not uh, unknown for Iran to actually give uh, rewards and praise to citizens, even of other countries, who commit terrorist attacks in the West or wherever Iran has its interests. Yes, I read that uh, Rushdie's bounty was on about three million dollars for the person who who could go ahead and and, and kill him. Uh, but like I like I said at the top of the podcast, uh, unfortunately, Rushdie is not the only one that's been targeted by the Iranian regime. There's also this um, uh, Iranian American journalist called Masih Ali Najad, who's an activist for human rights and particularly women's rights in Iran which is a society that brutally oppresses, oppresses women. Uh, she was born in Iran and, and worked in Iran, but relocated to New York City and is now an American citizen, which is something that is very relevant. Um, so a little bit about her. She was very active um, trying to put an end to compulsory hijab. She says that whoever, whatever, whoever wants to wear a hijab can do it, but it shouldn't be something that's compulsory. And she's also, like I said, fought for other uh, for women to to gain more rights in Iran. And uh, so, the Iranian government has been looking at her and paying attention to her moves and trying to to make her stop for many many years, including when she eventually moved to the to the U.S. Uh, she had this 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 TV show that uh, showed what 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 life was like in Iran. And she would get footage from like videos and audios from people living in Iran that would send it to her to make visible the oppression that they were living. And the Iranian government threatened to imprison, imprison for up to 10 years anyone that helped her do this, that sent her any material. And she's been fighting against, uh, she's been an activist uh, against the Iranian regime and its oppression for most of her adult life and uh she's been very a very significant uh activist in this cause in 2019 for in, for instance she met with uh u.s secretary of state mike pompeo and she made uh, a few points about iran the first point that she made was that most iranians w are completely oppressed by the government and they want to end the islamic republic they do not want that regime the second demand that she made was that the international community leaded, led by the uh, United States should condemn in the strongest possible terms the decades of oppression of human rights by Iran. And third, she made a point about at that moment there was what it was called the Muslim ban uh, put on by Trump that uh, she said that it really didn't do anything to Iranian government, but what it did was uh, make it really hard for activists and students to get to the U.S., especially those that needed to be safe from, persecu from persecution. And later that year, after she met with Pompeo, the, the Iranian government ramped up their harassing and their uh, attempts to, 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 to stop her. And one of the things they did was they, they uh, uh, arrested her family back in Iran. Um, they, were com they were repeatedly harassed. They were forced to go on live TV to condemn her and disown her, even though they, they didn't want to do that, but they were threatened by the Iranian government. So she, is, she has been subject of something that is very common in Iran, all these tactics to intimidate people to just shut up and stop 
um, stop uh, speaking about the regime, even if they're not living in Iran. So she endured a smear campaign for over 10 years. They did things to her that are unspeakable and to her family. And finally, last year in July 2021, the Department of Justice uncovered a plot by Iranian intelligence officials to kidnap Aline Jad and four other people uh, in the UK and Canada. And the plot included maps from Aline Jad's uh, residence to how to, to get to and from her residence in New York City and a sea route from, uh, from New York to Venezuela. Why Venezuela? because Venezuela is an ally of Iran and they wanted to take her there to in, not just intimidate her, but do who knows what to her. So uh, that plot was uh, thankfully foiled, but then on July 28th of this year, uh, an Iranian agent approached her house in New York and he had an AKA 47 and he was trying to open the doors, looking inside through the windows, trying to open the windows. And finally, thankfully, the FBI was able to, uh, to, to stop this man from, from doing, from actually killing her. And the FBI told her, yeah, with the intention of this man was to actually kill you. And she, she escaped by a hair basically, because he wasn't able to get in to her house. But this is something that keeps happening. And it's not just Alina Jad, it's not just Rushdie. There's also other uh, other people in the U.S., prominent people that are, have sp spoken against the Iranian regime or carried out actions against the Iranian regime that have also been uh, subject of pl of plots to to assassinate them. And you, Michael Bolton is uh, sorry, not Michael Bolton. I'm sorry, John Bolton uh, is one of the of the people that uh, that has been. Um, one one of the victims of these of these threats, and I think you, you can talk a little bit about that, Nikos, as well. Yes. So the context here is that Iran officially has said that they want to take revenge for the killing of Qasem Soleimani back in 2020. So who was Qasem Soleimani? He was the leader of the Quds forces. So the Revolutionary Guard has a corp, a, a, a part of the Revolutionary Guards. They have as their goal. To, make, to, have, to take operations abroad. Quds literally means Jerusalem. So the idea is that this, that, that, that this force is engaged in wars abroad, helping Shiite population and other radical Muslims abroad. So Soleimani was the hero of the Iran-Iraq war. He was behind the rise of the Shiites in Iraq and their fight against the Americans. And he was perhaps the most decorated and the most prestigious officer in Iran. So in 2020, he was killed by an American drone and the Iranians have said that they will take a revenge. And this revenge will include people in high places. So as you said, John Bolton was a target, but not only John Bolton. And it's not unknown for Iran to try to operate in American soil. Some years ago, they tried to assassinate the uh, the Saudi ambassador in Washington by actually hiring some hitmen from a Mexican, a very a very cruel and uh, violent Mexican cartel. The operation didn't uh, work at the last minute because someone from the DEA who was an insider to the cartel stopped it, but it would be a very bloody operation. But what is the most interesting thing here is that the American government openly recognizes that, look, we have Iranian operatives or people with relations to officials in Iran, people with relations to the revolutionary guns, guards in Iran. We have people who want to assassinate targets in the United States. And actually, the government and the security services are spending millions every year to protect some of these individuals. So this very government, this very same state mechanism, which acknowledges that Iran is a threat. Iran wants to kill officials and citizens within the United States, is a state mechanism, is a government that is discussing going back to the table with Iran and discussing the nuclear deal or finding ways to improve the relationships with Iran. Why they're doing this, it's something which 
I think Onkar can uh, can enlighten us. Yes, yeah, so Onkar, one of the things that uh, Bolton claims is that the, these Iranian operatives are doing this because of Biden's uh, weak stance on Iran, uh, particularly on the Iran nuclear deal. Do you agree with this assessment? I agree with it in part, but not in essence. So it is that Iran is encouraged and emboldened because of U.S. policy. But the idea that it's just Biden's policy and the policies before that have been effective at deterring or combating Iran is unfortunately a joke. So if, he, if what Bolton thinks is, well, when I had more of the ear of the president and so on, we did better things. The U.S. policy has been an abysmal failure all the way back to the rise of the Iranian regime. We'll talk a little bit about the history, I think, a bit later in the podcast. But if you just think after 9-11, and we at the Ayn Rand Institute, we argued this immediately after 9-11, the target, no matter what else you do in response to the attacks on U.S. soil in New York and in Washington, the massive loss of life, no matter what else you do, you have to remove the Iranian regime. There's other things that could be done. Saudi Arabia is a huge problem. But the Iranian regime is the inspiration for Islamic totalitarianism um, throughout the Middle East and specifically in regard to viewing the U.S. as an enemy. So Iran has been at war with the U.S. for decades. And we don't know it or better we evade the fact, that fact. We don't want to know it. And our uh, governments have not wanted to know and have not wanted to face it. So the, after 9-11, the Bush administration, it's, oh, Iraq is the big problem. The attackers come from Saudi Arabia, another place that spreads the ideology of Islamic totalitarianism. It's a different version. So Saudi Arabia and Iran are supposedly great enemies and so on. But from the point of view of the United States, what they're both doing is emboldening people who think that Islam should rule the world, including should rule the Western world. And until you face that and say that that is a non-starter, and when you take up arms in the name of that ideology, your life will be ended and your regimes will be ended, um, you can't do anything about this threat. And so the Bush, um, after 9-11, the Bush administration did worse than nothing because what you convey when you attack Iraq and you leave Iran alone, what you convey is that you're too scared or you don't have the courage to attack the actual fountainhead of the attacks. And that over time will just say, okay, well, we can get away with it. And the Obama administration went on a whole apology tour through the Middle East that we're not going to do what the Bush administration does. And the Bush administration, what it did was worse than useless. And, the, and, and Obama goes on an apology tour. Trump does uh, basically nothing, has no policy. And if you've seen some of the things he said about Islamic totalitarianism, for instance, when there are attacks in Garland on a cartoonist in America, Trump's response was, can he draw something else? That was Trump's response. And that captures his soul, unfortunately. Um, and then you get to Biden, who, as Nico said, wants to restart talks with Iran. But in terms of thinking about the recruitment for people to this cause, you can't just view it sort of country in isolation. Well, Ryan, we have one policy. Saudi Arabia, we have another policy. We have another policy in Afghanistan. That's not how it's viewed throughout the Middle East. And the withdrawal from Afghanistan and the way, the chaotic nature of it, all that conveys is U.S. weakness and U.S. that we have no idea what we're doing. Um, that we spend 14 years in Afghanistan and we, and we withdraw like this, that you don't think that will embolden them. And it takes time. This is not the, the, the strongest or smartest of enemies. So the emboldening, it's not like, okay, next week we're going to see all kinds of attacks. But it's that kind of thing. Um, and our whole policy, the 
unfortunately, the withdrawal from Afghanistan was a capstone on that really was our policy, that we had no idea what we're doing, what we're trying to accomplish, what victory would look like. And that's what is emboldened the, these, um, uh, these enemies and these kinds of attacks. Yes, Ankar, and you mentioned uh, Saudi Arabia, and I think he, well, Biden's dealing with authori dealings with authoritar authoritarian regimes has been pr really bad so far. Um, and there was some hope that he would be a little bit better. I mean, the bar is really low, like you said, but there they was hope that he would be a little bit better uh, on the Middle East than previous presidents, but he's clearly not. Like, for instance, what well, like you said, like, you mentioned Saudi Arabia, and just uh, last month or in, in June, I forget, uh, Biden went to Saudi Arabia to resume talks with the Saudi regime uh, to try to uh, ramp up the, 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 the energy products that we get from Saudi Arabia and had a friendly, completely friendly conversation with the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who has been uh, proven by U.S. intelligence to have been the one that ordered the assassination of journalist of the Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi. So, only a few years after this happened, after the Khashoggi murder, uh, Biden goes to Saudi Arabia, gives uh, Mohammed uh, bin Salman, the Crown Prince, a fist bump. And they have a friendly conversation and they start negotiating because Biden wants to try to see if he can solve the energy crisis with the, with Saudi help. And to me, that is completely outrageous. And, uh, you know, Biden kept saying, oh, yeah, well, we're going to Saudi Arabia, but we're staying true to American values. And I have not forgotten about all the human rights violations by, by the Saudis. And I have not forgotten about the Khashoggi murder. And but then he goes talk to him. He sits on the table with him. He's friendly with him. And he says, like, after, after the fact, he said, well, the first thing I told him was that uh, he was responsible for the Khashoggi murder. And the, he said, well, not really. And then they just agreed to disagree, basically. And how is that staying true to American values? How is that something... I mean, the Saudis are like, yeah, we can get away with everything. I mean, uh, only three or four years after the, the murder... We have the president coming here and talking to us and seeking us out. So they can, they feel like they can get away with everything. And the same is true uh, for Venezuela, for instance. And it was not an Islamic, it's obviously not in the Middle East, not an Islamic regime, but it's an authoritarian regime, brutally oppressive, who's also an ally of Iran and Saudi Arabia and Russia, by the way. And uh, because of the energy crisis, Biden goes and seeks uh, their oil and is thinking about uh, lifting sanctions. And just with a, a, a short-term policy that is not going to work, and also Venezuela is an ally of Russia. So they, Biden on one hand is boycotting Russia, and then on the other hand is going to knock on the door of Maduro, who has spread, spread, expressed full support for Putin. So definitely this is not the stance to take with these authoritarian regimes, especially in the Middle East. But... Um, like you said, Onkar, this is not just Biden. This is a, a story of really bad policy towards the Middle East and Iran in particular. And uh, th there's a lot to say about uh, about the, the the history, which started around 1979. And uh, but why don't like so after the rush, the uh, assassination attempt, Biden said something about the about the, the 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 attempt and i'd like to onkar if you can it's a very short statement it's like two paragraph i like onkar if you can say a little bit about what you think of that statement by biden it fits biden but it fits him in the complete amoralism so it's the pretense at caring about morality, which is exactly the same thing with his visit to Saudi Arabia. It's when he gets criticized for it. Don't tell me I don't care about morality. I have uh, opposed the killing of Kosogi, and I've talked to him and told him that, and he denies it. And, and that is, um, it's in some ways worse 
than if you um, didn't bring it up. To bring it up in a way that is suggests that, yeah, it happened. Why make a big deal of it? Why should it change our actions and conduct? Um, and this is worse than his action in Saudi Arabia because it's simultaneously, so it's two paragraphs expressing shock. He's saddened by the attack on Rushdie. Yeah, but was it a foreseeable attack? And then he goes on to praise Rushdie and he praises Rushdie because Rushdie refuses to be intimidated or silenced. Those are word, words from the statement. He's, and in a statement where you're praising Rushdie for standing up for freedom of speech and saying, I can hold the views that I want in regard to Islam and in re regard to Iran, and I should be able to write a novel about these things, and I should be able to do that in peace, not with a price on my head. So, he praises Rushdie for standing up to that without any mention of the fatwa against Rushdie, any mention of Iran, and that Iran has put a price on his head, and that that price has endured to this day. Any mention of, yeah, I've been thinking about or trying to renegotiate with Iran, bring them back to the so-called negotiating table. I now will question that whole approach to Iran, given this. Um, and no mention of Islam or and of the, that what it was that Rushdie was facing. And when Nikosin earlier describing it said there were protests throughout the Middle East, those are manufactured protests, manufactured by the government, in this case led by Iran, but what we saw after 9-11, say with the Danish cartoon crisis, to say those protests throughout the Middle East about the Danish cartoon crisis means that the governments have, have, have um, and sometimes even forced, but encouraged and fomented this kind of protest. As, as in the Danish cartoon crisis, most of the protesters had never seen the cartoons, but they were told it's blasphemy and a religious mentality follows orders without asking for reasons or evidence. And the same thing happened with the Rushdie thing. You think the people protesting had read the satanic verses? No, they were told that there, this contains blasphemy and I'm going to, and I have to protest and I've been ordered to protest. And that's what my religion, our religious leaders are telling me to do and I will obey. And there's not a word about any of that in Biden's statement while simultaneously praising Rushdie that he wouldn't be intimidated or silenced. Intimidated by what? Silenced by whom? No mention in the statement. And that is, it's such a betrayal of Rushdie while having the pretense, oh yeah, I care about this and I'm a moral person and here's my statement about how bad this was. And so it, it's an abomination. Right, um, so this is definitely an abomination, but it's like you mentioned before, Ankari, Biden is not the first one to be bad on Iran or, or the Middle East. He is, in fact, not just failing to see the nature of the enemy, but he's not even identifying the enemy, it seems like, from, from this statement. Uh, but going back to a little bit of the history, like Biden is not the, the first one. So, uh, Nikos, can you can you uh, tell us a little, little bit more about uh, what is Iran and what how what the different uh, approaches that the U.S. has taken towards Iran have developed over the years? Yes. So, anti-American hatred has been prevalent in Iran since the mid '50s. Now, the reason has to do supposedly with the support that the United States gave to the Shah, who was the king of Persia to overthrow a nationalist called Mossadegh who wanted to nationalize uh, Persian oil. But soon these anti-Americans got a different uh, turn, which was a religious turn. So in 1979, uh, there's a big revolution in Iran, orchestrated and uh, organized by various different fractions from the left, uh, from Islamists, but they all agreed in one thing, that they hated the West and they hated the United States. So in 1979, in January, Sa uh, leaves, uh, leaves Iran. So the guy who gets in charge is Khomeini, later to become the Ayatollah Khomeini, so the, the, the supreme leader of Iran. 
Now, a key moment for the Iranian-American relations is the 4th of September of 1979. And this is the day when a group of students with the approval of the Revolutionary Guards and very soon also with the sanction of Khomeini would invade and they would, uh, they would attack the U.S. Embassy in Tehran. Now, this was not a spontaneous uh, demonstration. The students were actually brought there with buses, so it had the sanction of the Iranian government. And they held more than 50 people, diplomats and other personnel, hostages for 444 days, so for more than a year. It was a huge moment for Khomeini. It was a huge victory for Ayatollah Khomeini because he would show to everyone in Iran and to the Middle East that I am the biggest enemy of America. I am the biggest enemy of the United States. So in a way, he would outdo the left within Iran in anti-Americanism and he will he, will, he would boost his image as the main enemy of the United States. So this is why the 4th of September, sorry, the 4th of November, not September, the 4th of November of 1979 was the day that was celebrated in, uh, in, in forthcoming years as the Death to America Day. Now, even more embarrassing for the United States than the fact that more than 50 people of its embassy staff were held as hostages, was an attempt to release them that was a complete fiasco a military attempt to release them but also how this story actually uh, finished how the hostage was uh, resolved so in 1980 some a couple of months after the hostage situation began saddam hussein and iraq attacked iran so khomeini was in deep trouble most of his weapons were american weapons and he very soon he would need ammunition and he would need uh, new particles for his weapons. So he realized that he needs to start smoothing his relationship with the United States. So this is why in early 1981, the hostages are released. And indeed, soon, within some years, the United States pay back the favor and in what became known as the Iran contrast deal, the United States, initially through Israel and then by themselves, would give weapons to Iran. So notice the weird situation. Officially, the United States, God knows why, supports Saddam Hussein. But at the same time, from the back door, they also support Iran. Two of their arch enemies. Iran was already an arch enemy. Saddam Hussein would later prove to become an enemy. So the history of the relationship between the United States and Iran is a history of appeasement. And one last thing, you mentioned the, the post 9-11 uh, world. So who were the number one allies of the United States in Afghanistan? Their Northern Alliance. Who were the Northern Alliance loyal to? Of course, Iran. Who? Uh, who took advantage of the void of power in Iran? Of course, Again, Shiites that were guided, organized by Iran itself. So in a way, the post 9-11 policy by the United States is a huge gift to Iran. So in a way, the same and the embarrassment of the hostage situation back then under Carter administration was never washed off. And... Um... Oh, Carl, I have a related question uh, to that, which is one of the things, for instance, and, and this is not just ex exclusive to Saudi Arabia, but one of the reasons that Biden gave to go to Saudi Arabia was not just, you know, about the energy crisis and all of that, but also he said that Saudi Arabia is a very valuable uh, ally in the fight against Iran. Do you think that is the case? No. The it, not from the perspective of U.S. interests. So there might be some perspective in which Iran and Saudi Arabia are enemies, but in the same way that communists and Nazis were enemies, they're fighting over the same thing and both trying to exert dominion and totalitarian control. Uh, so it's like two gangsters fighting. 
And there are contexts in which you can pl try to play one gangster off the other. But when you're thinking of long-term American interest, it is that the idea of totalitarian Islam, of a fundamentalist re uh, religion, wielding political power that has an animus and hatred towards the West, that is an enemy, that is potentially dangerous, and that is what you need to disarm and contain. And that is what was required after 9-11, was to reformulate US policy, to, to, to view 9-11 as the product of previous US policy, as you can say in a sense of failure, but as a predictable outcome of what US policy was since 1979, since the rise of Iran and its attack on America, I mean, t seizing an embassy, an embassy is viewed as the territory of the country whose embassy it is. Seizing an embassy, that was an act of war against the US. And Iran knew it. We would not face that fact for 20 years. Someone who would probably still be thought of as he's the most in, in the, the, the metaphorical, non-conceptual language they use for this, the most hawkish, would be Reagan. And Reagan did, I mean, not just nothing in regard to Iran, as Nikos was talking about. He traded arms for hostages for, with Iran. So for, for two decades, our policy in the Middle East was arming these people. And 9-11 was the outcome. And what was required is a rethinking of that. That's what did not happen. And a rethinking would have been, yeah, it, it's what we're facing is a rise of a fundamentalist regime, uh, religion seeking political power. And the Saudi Arabia and Iran in different ways are both doing this. And they're both then fundamentally enemies. Um, and the idea so that you're going to play some kind of game that, oh, no, but Saudi Arabia is a little more friendly to us than Iran. Um, Saudi Arabia is, is less kind of crusading totalitarian than Iran is. And that's why Iran is the fountainhead for these and the inspiration for these people who wage war against America. But uh, Saudi Arabia is not some innocent country um, that you can pretend is a friend. And that that part of our um, whole policy is an inability and unwillingness to view it in ideological terms. So, Onkar, so what I'm hearing is that the U.S. is failing to see the nature of, of the enemy, which is not ex exclusive to, to Iran, this nature of there is Islamic totalitarianism. So, and you mentioned earlier this um, religious tribalism that they uh, they put on 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 the on their people, and you were talking about all these uh, like uh, arranged protests and all of that, but. Can you say a bit more about the, the role of Islam in these regimes being the way they are and the hatred of uh, American and generally Western values? It, so it's plays the role that religion has played in many, many centuries in history, that it gives them both a cause to fight for, it gives them inspiration when you see the rise of Islam in the Middle East, it's part an explanation for that uh, parts of the Middle East Arab world, centuries past, were more prosperous. Why were they more prosperous? Why are they failing now? And rather than looking at the, their actual policies, form of government and culture, it's we've departed from Islam, we used to be more Islamic, this is what we need to return to, this will be a sense of self-esteem for us as countries and a race and a nation, and it's, it's, it's a whole mixture of collectives, I think, in the Middle East of the, of the way they think about it. And only if we were, would stay pure to our religion, if we would be fundamentalist about it, I mean, you were talking about the issue of the hijab, 
And it's when you look through the middle of the 20th century, and so it's not that they were all wearing this, and so, but it's the, like if we return to this supposedly golden past, and that's part of the, what the religion and religion is traditional, a traditional ideology. And then it has the, the kind of an element of purification and it has sinners. And so the West is viewed as introducing all the elements of sin. It's secular. It is about this world and so on. And what we need to return to and what we need, what will make us grand again is... Um, a, a an otherworldly draconian religion this is part of the fundamentalism and the, and so it has to wield political power it has to be all encompassing and that's what the iranian revolution as nikos put it that's what it what it's it's and that the religious faction won out that's what it means for it to win out and in so far as it's inspiring people it's inspiring them because they think there's some chance that we can actually accomplish this goal. And that's why you see when they come to power, whether it's the Taliban in Afghanistan, whether it's the Iranian regime, whether it was ISIS, when they actually come to power, you see their ability to recruit go sky high. And they're recruit, they're, it's because they're recruiting in an ideological way that it's this set of ideas has a chance to win and if you're unwilling to fate like that's what is going on in the middle east and so above all else what u.s policy has to convey is this set of ideas has zero chance of winning if you embrace this and really take up the cause all it will mean is your destruction and death not the spread of this ideology and you're going to win territory and you're going to kill Salman Rushdie and you're going to get the her heretics and so on. It's all that it will do is it's your destruction and death. And that's what U.S. foreign policy would have had to convey. And that's what we have been unwilling and unable to convey. And the response to 9-11, unfortunately, is not an exception. Um, it's not an accident that Iraq was targeted because it's one of the most secular uh, regimes in the Middle East. Can I add something to, to this? So many people, particularly so-called realists, make the mistake of undermining the role of ideology and religion in Iran and treating it as a country that just wants to maximize its security as a rational player in geopolitics. Nothing could be further from truth. So Iran would rather perish with its ideas rather than flourish without its ideas. Here's an example. In the Iran-Iraq war, again, Iraq attacks Iran in 1980. Within two years, they have pushed inside the, the Iranian, uh, Iranian land. So within two years, the Iran manages to push Iraq back to its, uh, to its, to its, original, to its original borders. And yet, the leadership in Iran decides to pursue the war inside Iraq to reach to the city of Karbala, which is a holy city for Shiites. They know perfectly well that war is almost unwinnable. The whole of the West, again, God knows why, and most of the regimes of the area support Iraq. And yet, why does the Iranian leadership support this war and why they still get volunteers for the war? Because they consider the war a spiritual experience. They consider it a chance for martyrdom. So there are many people who go to war knowing perfectly where well that they're going to die. One of the tactics they use in the Iran-Iraq war is the so-called human wave, which is basically a way for you to go and find your death. We can discuss it further in Clubhouse, but I can tell you it's the craziest thing I've ever read in my life when it comes to military tactics or the way a war is pursued. But what can explain it? The fact that Iranians, both the regime and the supporters, take their ideology and take their, religiously, their religion seriously. So what they say, they mean it. Iran is not a normal state. It should not be treated in the same way that you think about a state that pursues its self-interest. It does not pursue its self-interest. It pursues its ideals, and its ideals are the ones that we've described. They're literally in pursuit of death quite often, in pursuit of martyrdom. Martyrdom is more important than victory in some ways. 
So we have a super chat uh, from, from YouTube uh, related to what you were just talking about, Ankar, and it says, what would the state of Islamic terrorism be if we had attacked Iran in 1979 and returned the U.S. embassy hostages by force? It would have been radically diminished to non-existent. I, I'm taking that question to be that we did it in a righteous way. So it's not just simply, uh, so Nikos alluded to this episode of where Carter tried to send in some military helicopters to land and to evacuate, uh, I mean, to, to, to free the people at the embassy and evacuate them. And some of the helicopters crashed in the desert. So, but that, like, that's a, a, a military operation that went wrong. But a military operation that went right would be insufficient. So here to say that we did something after the attack on the American embassy, the, the way Ayn Rand put it is if we didn't march days after that, we're going we're gonna to have to, and we won't be able to live this down for decades, that this response. So what, it, what was required is a response that conveyed the moment you take up arms in the name of this ideology and attack America, that's the end. That's the end of you. Um, and it, it would have been, yes, freeing the hostages, but it, the, it, in a way that conveys this is a losing cause. And the moment you take up this cause, is the, that's when the bombs start dropping on you. And that's what was, is required to... There would have still been conflict in the Middle East, but they would have been scared of America. This is the whole, the, the metaphor they used, which in, unfortunately was accurate, that America's a paper tiger. Oh yeah, Reagan, for instance, he talks a big game, but then he negotiates with us in regard to hostages and so on. That is a paper tiger. And that, what you had to convey in action is that we're a tiger, not a paper tiger. It's that we will protect our interests. And the moment they're attacked, that's the end. Um, we're not negotiating. We're not talking. It's we're attacking. This is what should have happened after 9-11. In, in Afga Afghanistan was lost. I mean, we were there for years and years and years. But it was lost in the first few months. The first few months were negotiating with the Taliban. Will you release bin Laden and so on? And it should have been. After 9-11, the time for negotiation is over. Bombs should have started dropping. Uh, and, I mean, it's a whole military decision on how to do it. But you should have decapitated the regime, the terrorist camps and so on, not ne negotiate and they flee to the mountains and disperse and so on. And that, so that's, I take the question, like, if we had done that um, after the Iran's attack in 1979, the Middle East in, in terms of U.S. interests would have been radically different than it is today. And it, it, you would just would not have seen this because they would not have thought we're a paper tiger, would not have accurately thought we're a paper tiger. And it wouldn't just be, it's not that it just came back to bite us, but it also came back to bite the West in general with all terrorist attacks that have happened in, in Europe, for instance. But so one thing that, that got my attention from uh, this activist that I mentioned earlier, uh, Masia Linejad, was in an op-ed and a few interviews that she did after this assassination attempt that, that she was a, a victim of. She says that um, part of the, of the proper attitude that, that the U.S. and the West in general should have towards Iran is um, to get rid of all the any remaining Iranian diplomats or agents that may be in the US that are still are in the US, but also to identify the nature of of the, the of the nature of the regime. I, she doesn't go into the philosophical depth that you just described, Ankar, but she goes into saying that this is a regime that has been violating human rights for decades and that has this particular ideology that hates the West. 
And Iran is in an alliance of evil, she says. I don't think she puts it exactly like that, but that's the gist of what she says. With other regimes, and and you see this all the time, how evil you know, works together. You see it all the time in the UN. In the UN. And she says that part of what needs to happen is that the U.S. and the rest of the West, I mean, should form an alliance led by the U.S. because that is the only way to destroy, to, to confront this, this alliance of evil that is happening with Iran and other regimes. Do you agree with that? I agree with it in moral terms, not in military terms. So in moral terms, yes, the free and semi-free nations of the world should trumpet the one, the fact that they're free and that that is good and it's good for the citizens and it would be good for the people in the Middle East to live under freedom. And the regimes that are dedicated to first to um, eliminating the freedom of their own citizens and second of attacking neighboring countries and eliminating the free, their freedom as well, that is, those regimes are evil. And it's not that, well, a leader maybe steps out of bounds. The regime is evil. So, and so if there was um, concerted uh, and uh, concerted effort to do that among free nations, that would be a good thing. But even there, if just the U.S. did it, who cares what the U.K. or Germany say? If the U.S. did this and sided with um the people in these places that value freedom and genuinely cited, not paid lip service to these people in the way that, that Biden pays lip service to Rushdie. But if genuinely sided with this and viewed these regimes as evil and spoke about them as evil, that would be an enormous step forward. The, the, the reason it doesn't matter too much militarily, it's I mean, this is a deep point in objectivism that evil's impotent. So it doesn't really matter that there's an alliance between Venezuela, Iran, and Russia. I mean, okay, so three losers get together and have an alliance. It's not a threat if you were actually opposed to all these regimes. And as Nikos was talking about, I mean, when you read about the Iran-Iraq war, the idea that either is a, a military threat to the United States, if we were willing to fight, that's a joke. And that's even true, leave aside nuclear weapons, but that's even true of Russia. That's part of what one saw with Russia going into Afghanistan and they're fought to a stalemate. It's not that they had bad strategy and no goal. And so it's that militarily they were fought to a stalemate and withdrew from Afghanistan. That's not what happened to the U.S. U.S. was obviously militarily, we could have done anything we wanted in Afghanistan. We were unwilling in terms of policy. And you see the same with Russia in regard to Ukraine. So they're not these formidable military operations and so on. And that's part of what is so perverse here. It's there is no reason to cower before that. And the when one does, and when one placates them and negotiates and will trade arms for hostages and so on, you're giving them a power that there's absolutely no reason to give them. And, and, and that's the, the way in which this is an ideological conflict as well. It's we're not confident in our ideas and values and so don't assert them and appease and so on. We don't appease because we're militarily scared of these places. We appease because we have no self-esteem, no self-confidence, no ability to say our way of life is actually better. And um, I mean, we can talk about what a proper policy would be. Articulating that would be articulating it to the regimes and to the people in these nations. Um, and we, we do neither. So what would be that proper policy, Ankar? Well, part, so part of it would be confidence in our own ideals and our own values and a willingness to say they're better. They're better than what exists in the Middle East. And so part of the reason our policy, whether it's the Democrats who control Congress 
or the presidency, or it's the Republicans who control Congress or the presidency. The reason the policy has been basically the same is that neither side either understands or values American ideals. And so if you what the Democrats are much more, who are we to say what happens in the Middle East is good or bad? Um, they're on the multiculturalist axis that every culture is as good as every other. And yeah, maybe what we do in America, we like, and but if they want to oppress women and force them to wear a hijab, and so who are we to say? That's their culture, let them do what they want. Everyone's equal, every culture is equal. You saw this, the whenever after 9-11, whenever someone brought up, well, maybe there's something problematic in Islam as it's preached and taught and spread today, like a Sam Harris, when he did this, it was he was met by people who would view themselves as on the left, probably vote Democrat, so on, as you can't say that. Every culture is equal, every religion is equal. Who are you to say that there's something wrong and bad in Islam as it's preached today? And on the other side of the Republicans, because the this whole axis has embraced religion they dare not face the issue. And Ayn Rand named this in 1979, that the fact is, so this was with the rise of Reagan and the new Republic. The fact is Iran's regime is what they want. They want to end the separation of church and state. They want religion to play a crusading role. I mean, we saw this, for instance, with the overturning of Roe v. Wade. This is a real fundamentalist, religious mentality. And that's, they can't really face the issue of there's something problematic with a fundamentalist religious um, mentality that's demanding political power, because that's what they're doing. And so, and you saw this after 9-11, Bush went out of his way to say, whatever the cause is, it's not religion, it's not Islam, Islam's a religion of peace. He invited uh, Islamic preachers to pray and so on. It's whatever you do, don't you dare say something is bad about religion. And so both sides for, for ideological reasons are pushed to evade what is actually happening. And that, so the first policy would be to end that evasion and to face the ideological rise of Islamic totalitarianism. But I would say the second thing that we've been abysmal at is you're trying to turn the people against the regime. So it's not that we hate Iran. We hate the Iranian regime. And we think there's something fundamentally wrong with the idea that religion should wield political power. But there's a lot of people in Iran who think that. And there have been protests against the regime. And, so, and this was of... Obama's apology to or through the Middle East was really, really bad. Even worse was when there were protests going on in Iran, he would not side with the protesters and say, we saw to any of the protesters who are genuinely seeking freedom, we're on your side and we're an enemy of your regime. And part of the reason, not the only reason, but part of the reason we're an enemy of your regime is that they oppress you and they take away your freedom and you should be able to live in freedom. And you would win support in these countries. And so it's also what was so tragic after 9-11. Of all the countries, I think, and Nikos, you should talk, you're reading some of the history of what you think about this. I think of all the countries in the Middle East where it was, if you think we're going to remove the regime and then want to put a pro-Western regime and approach to politics in the country, Iran was the most plausible that you would be able to do that, that you could decapitate the regime and there were enough people who were actually a little more on the side of freedom and that we didn't do that. Then we went into Iraq. It's again, it's just a failure of our policy. <clears throat> so, yes, so actually in Iran, there's a lot of uh, anti-regime uh, uh, potential. There were the protests in 2009. Uh, there's a, th there has been every now and then movements like the one Agustina described uh, for the for the removal of the of the of the hijab. And 
there's one thing that from personal experience it took me um, it took me many years to understand. So I never understood why would objectively say Saudi Arabia and Iran. Because in my mind, I said, wait a minute, the Saudi Arabia are Sunnis. The Su- uh, in Egypt, they are Sunnis. They were behind 9-11. So why not Iran? But reading about the Islamic world and political Islam, it cannot be undermined how important this, the Iranian revolution was, not only for Iran and not only for Shiites. So thinking about Hezbollah, thinking about, for example, the Shiites in Iraq, that's easy to understand what has been the role of the Iranian revolution. But it's interesting to see how the Iranian revolution has radicalized even Saudi Arabia. Because suddenly Saudi Arabia had to show, no, we are the real uh, advocates of uh, God uh, on earth. We are the real leaders of, is- of Islam. Or how it radicalized Pakistan. Pakistan started drifting more and more and more towards a society ruled by, by religious rule. So, or even the Muslim Brotherhood, which again in Egypt, it's a Sunni organization, but they pledged allegiance to, uh, to Khomeini, not to mention uh, the Palestinians and not to mention Hamas. Again, Hamas, mostly a Sunni organization, but with relations to Iran. So I would encourage people to read the history of, uh, of the region so that they don't make the mistake that I made for years which was not understanding why is Iran so important and why did objectivists after 9-11 uh, refer to Iran, which on a superficial level had nothing to do with 9-11 itself. And uh, we're at time, but I have one last uh, question for, for both of you. So Ankar, you mentioned what a proper U.S policy should be towards Iran and the Middle East in general. But there's also the issue that intellectuals, and you mentioned a little bit when Sam Harris said, um, spoke against uh, Islam, he was, or not spoke, like even like said, said the facts about Islam, let's say. He was called like by, by mostly the left saying like, well, who are you to say? Or uh, he probably was called an Islamophobe and things like that. So what is the role of intellectuals and academia and what uh, students are being taught at universities uh, when it comes to the view that we should have on the Middle East? Well, they're taught one version or another of cultural relativism. Uh, Multiculturalism is that applied to cultures that every culture is equal. So to say they're relative, is you can compare cultures, but to think that, yeah, but everyone's basically as good as everyone else, and so is just to surrender moral judgment. And the whole impetus, and unfortunately what people, uh, students learn in most universities is uh, that to be anti-American. So th- th- when you equate things that actually aren't equal, that when you equate the good and the bad, you elevate the bad and you're tearing down the good. So here it's, to, to, it, what it ends up happening is people think, and you meet many students like this, who think the regimes in, whether it's in Saudi Arabia or Iran or the Palestinians. And if you look at how, when the, the PLO or Hezbollah or Hamas are in power, and what they do to their own subjects, they're completely ignorant of that, or it's been white, it's worse than ignorance. They think, oh yeah, they build them hospitals and so on, not that they're essentially what they do is oppress their own citizens. Um, so it's not like just they hate the Jews or something like that. They hate free people and they oppress their own and they will oppress people in other countries. So they don't learn that. And they simultaneously think they learn how the US is the, the instigator and responsible for all the problems in this case in the middle east and if it isn't we were on the side of the shah and it's true we shouldn't have been on the side of the shah so there's a lot of problems in u.s foreign policy i mean we've been critical of it in this whole hour so it's not to say the policy is good but if you think it's the policy of the u.s that has led to these regimes and to these um to these barbaric regimes it's, you don't understand anything. 
So, and that's part of what, I mean, Sam Harris was in effect, it was, don't we need to look at the actual facts and what they learn too often in university is nothing resembling the facts because the, the actual regimes are whitewashed and then it looks like, well, the America's responsible for everything because there are failings in America's foreign policy, but both are false. It, it's not essentially what's happened in the Middle East is not America's fault. And um, that these regimes care about their subjects and so on is, I mean, that's such a betrayal of the many, many hundreds of thousands of people that these regimes have terrorized and even killed. Okay, so uh, we are at time. Um, thank you, Ankar and Nikos. And uh, well, uh, for anyone that still has questions, was to keep discussing. Ankar and Nikos will be on Club Clubhouse right after the show at the Ayn Rand Club. Um, so, well, thank you to everyone who submitted super chats and supported the Institute in that way. And we have some resources that uh, people may want to look at to learn more about our topic today. One of them is the book, Failing to Confront Islamic Totalitarianism by Onkar and uh, Ilan Giorno. We uh, have a, uh, if you, this is an older book, but we've had an expanded edition that uh, launched uh, last year. So make sure you, you get that edition. Uh, and we also have uh, Leonard Peikoff's essay, End States Who Sponsor Terrorism. And we have also by Leonard Peikoff, Religious Terrorism Versus Free Speech. I highly recommend uh, everyone to take a look at those essays. So if you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe to our channel on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast. And on YouTube, click the bell to get notifications for when we go live and or post new videos and if you're watching uh, a recording please like and share it uh, and please consider doing the same for uh, facebook if you're watching there so if you have any questions or comments about today's episodes or if you have suggestions for future episodes you can send us an email at newideal at and we read all of your emails and we reply to many of them so thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Nikos. Thank you, Onkar. And we'll see you next week.